week. And feedback from NHS boards has been that the situation in accident and emergency uh, is also stabilising. Um, and obviously we'll see the weekly statistics published tomorrow morning. Uh, that said, any waiting times for many are still far higher uh, than they should be. And that is caused to a very significant extent by the fact that hospitals remain very full. Uh, despite some initial, uh, very initial indications of a very slight easing of some winter pressure in the past week, hospital occupancy is still very high at this stage. In summary, therefore, pressure remains intense, but we do hope to see a further easing of it in the weeks ahead. And of course, we remain focused on supporting the service to address these pressures. I chaired another meeting of the Cross-Government Resilience Committee last Friday. Actions remain focused on two key areas. First, ensuring as much advice and support as possible is available to help people where safe and appropriate to avoid attendance at hospital. The ambulance service Hear and Treat and See and Treat initiatives, hospital at home and the continued build-up of NHS 24 capacity are all important in this regard. And second, ensuring timely discharge from hospital of patients generally, but in particular tackling delayed discharges. The Health Secretary's announcement last week of additional funding for health and care partnerships to secure available beds in care homes is important in that regard. Of course, the use of care beds on an interim basis is not new. There are already around 600 beds being used for this purpose, but this additional funding will help create even more capacity. Since that announcement was made, detailed guidance has been issued. Health and care partnerships have been working with individual care providers to identify available beds and match them with patients as appropriate. And the Resilience Committee will be receiving regular updates on progress. In addition to securing additional care home capacity, I can confirm that health boards have been asked to review before the end of January all discharge plans in acute and community hospitals to identify any patients who should be discharged more quickly and help resolve any issues that might be preventing their discharge from hospital. I also indicated last week that guidance was being issued giving health boards the flexibility during this period of intense pressure to take action they consider necessary and appropriate to protect critical and life-saving care. At present, three health boards, uh, NHS Borders, NHS Ayrshire and Arran and NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, have temporarily paused non-urgent elective procedures in order to prioritise more urgent treatment for those who need it. Now, pausing non-urgent electives, while sometimes, uh, as is obvious, uh, necessary for a short period, nevertheless lengthens waiting times for patients. So I can confirm that the government is currently working with the Golden Jubilee and with other health boards to make additional capacity available for elective operations over the weeks uh, to come to minimise the knock-on pressure on waiting times. Uh, that will include weekday and weekend capacity and support specialties such as ophthalmology, orthopaedics and general surgery. Now, the final development since last week that is, I think, worth briefly mentioning relates to NHS pay negotiations. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very pleased to uh, say that as a result of further discussions between the Health Secretary and Health Trade Unions last week, the prospect of any immediate strike action in NHS Scotland has been removed. It is hard to overstate the importance of that. Um, I don't want NHS staff to feel the need to strike at any time, but the impact on patients and indeed on staff in this period of acute pressure would have been especially difficult. I want to thank health trade unions for agreeing to move forward quickly now to discussion and I hope early agreement of next year's pay deal. Uh, lastly, let me just round off with an appeal to the public. For those eligible, please get your flu and COVID vaccines if you haven't already. Uh, to everyone, to help reduce the risk of getting and spreading infection, please remember, uh, as we uh, all learned during the toughest times of the pandemic, uh, the importance of hand washing and good ventilation. And please consider wearing a face covering on public transport or in indoor public places, uh, including healthcare settings like GP waiting rooms or hospitals. Uh, so with these uh, relatively brief comments, I will now move straight to questions. And of course, the Health Secretary and the Chief Medical Officer will take questions too. Uh, so I will go firstly to... Colin Mackay from STV. 
First Minister, I've, I've got two quick questions for you. One is from the Scottish Conservatives who are complaining that patients are having to wait years for diagnostic tests, sometimes up to three or four years. Is the current crisis going to exacerbate that and make them wait any long, even longer? And a second one, which is really just for you, of the two options that came from your national executive at the weekend, which do you support? Um, on that first question, my views were set out in June, so I think you know the answer uh, to that question, but it's important given the importance and the magnitude of this decision for the SNP and by extension for the country that uh, our special conference in March uh, gets the opportunity to look at uh, the options put forward on Saturday, but also any other options that might be submitted by way of amendments and come to a collective decision. And I look forward to these discussions, uh, both in the run-up to and at the special conference in March. Um, on the uh, question about the health service, if I can now uh, turn as quickly as I can to that, and I'll ask the health secretary to say something about the investment and work uh, that is, has already been underway and continues uh, to be taken forward to increase diagnostic capacity. Um, as I said in my uh, statement, any work to pause non-urgent elective care, of course, has an impact on waiting times, but we are working very hard to minimise that and to ensure catch-up as part of the overall uh, recovery from COVID uh, work that is uh, being undertaken in the NHS. In terms of some of what is in the, the media today, um, I should say I'm not intending at all to minimise the impact on a patient who's been waiting an excessive period of time. But sometimes these cases that are cited about very excessive waits, I can't go into the detail of them, obviously because of patient confidentiality, but often with some of these uh, cases, there will be more complexity to these cases than perhaps is is presented. But that said, there is no doubt waiting times across uh, different procedures in the NHS right now are longer than we want them to be, which is why we are uh, working in the various ways we, we talk about uh, to reduce these. Specifically on diagnostics, I'll ask Humza to say a word about the work that is underway. Yeah, <coughs> thanks, First Minister. Happy uh, to do so. So clearly we're working to invest in as much capacity as we possibly can, and particularly as we begin to see some easing, slight easing uh, of those pressures, if that continues over the weeks and the months to come, uh, that's where significant investment will go. So as an example, uh, we'll release an additional uh, further 1.5 million to in increase uh, CT, MRI and ultrasound scan activity uh, by a further uh, almost 15,000 scans uh, between uh, this month and, and, and March. Uh, of, of, of this year. Um, I, I should say from the investment we've actually made thus far in 2022-23, it's expected to deliver an additional uh, 106,000 CT, MRI and ultrasound scans. So we'll keep investing in that capacity, create it where we possibly can. Uh, but as I say, uh, hopefully as pressures begin to ease ever so slightly, uh, that gives us the opportunity to invest in that additional, uh, and make use of that additional capacity. Thanks. Uh, Claire McAllister from the BBC. Um, First Minister, you talked about empowering health boards to make decisions at local level and the three health boards that paused elective and the majority of health boards we spoke to are taking some type of emergency measures. So is this still the right approach and how concerned are you by the decision to cancel some elective surgeries and at what point should these decisions on the, the kind of bigger scale decisions of what to do here be coming from the Scottish Government? Uh, yes, I, I do think it's the right approach and uh, I think as, as you all know from uh, listening to me over many, many, many months, day in and day out, standing at this podium, uh, the government doesn't hesitate to step in and take really tough decisions around healthcare, both uh, the delivery of, of healthcare through the NHS, but wider public health uh, interventions if we think that is necessary. But right now it is important uh, to empower local health boards because while they are all dealing with intense pressure, uh, that will be manifesting itself in different ways in different parts of the country at times. Um, and obviously no two health boards are exactly the same in terms of the uh, the, the makeup of the, the areas they cover. If we were to step in right now and, for example, uh, you know, 
call for or, or give an instruction for a nationwide pausing of non-urgent electives, then arguably that would be go going beyond what is required in some health boards and having a disproportionate and unnecessary impact on patients. So I think it is right and proper to allow uh, health boards to make these decisions and for all health boards or any health board uh, that takes action like postponing uh, non-urgent electives, the important point is that that should be for as short a period as possible and there should be as much uh, attention paid to how we catch up on that activity as, as possible. Um, I don't know, Gregor, if you want to add anything? So if you look around the country just now, if you look at, the, for instance, the, the flu incidents that uh, we have around about the country just now, we've got a, a really different picture in each of our health boards just now. We've got some boards who are sitting with a flu incidence only at moderate levels. We've got some at high levels. We've still got a few who remain at extraordinary levels. But the national picture has moved from extraordinary to uh, to, to high in terms of the level of incidence that we're seeing the flu just now. Therefore, it's really important that we give um, the, the, the health boards the ability to be able to determine what they need to do to <coughs> demand uh, according to their local area and the type of disease that they are seeing and need to respond to. Thanks. Uh, right, my list says Peter Smith from ITV News, but I'm not seeing Peter, so I'm assuming he isn't here. Uh, James Cook. Thanks, First Minister. Um, Two, again, hopefully very quick questions. One, hospital occupancy. I think if I remember in previous weeks, you'd mentioned a figure of 95%. I don't think you gave us a figure there. I wonder if you have that figure. And, and secondly, um, Sir Keir Starmer is the latest person to express concerns about the, the Scottish Parliament's gender legislation. Um, Stephen Flynn this morning describing it as an outrage if, if that is blocked. Is it really an outrage if, if people use the established mechanism to try to resolve potential conflict in the law set out in the Scotland Act 1998? Um, firstly, uh, on hospital occupancy, the figure hasn't really changed since last week. Um, some of the feedback from NHS boards would suggest, if anything, it is very marginally higher than it was last week, but it is broadly uh, in the same, which is why I said, uh, you know, if, if that figure had changed much, I, I would have given it, um, but it is broadly in and hospital occupancy because of the flow of patients uh, will probably take longer to start to reduce than accident and emergency waiting times, for example. So uh, these things are all interconnected. Um, yes, I think it would be um, an outrage. Um, you refer to established procedures, of course, in respect of uh, Section 35 of the Scotland Act, a procedure that has not been used in almost a quarter of a century of the, uh, the existence of the Scottish Parliament. Um, in my view, uh, there are no grounds to challenge this legislation. It is within the competence of the Scottish Parliament. It doesn't affect the operation of the Equality Act. And it was passed by an overwhelming majority of the Scottish Parliament after very lengthy and very intense scrutiny by MSPs of all parties represented in the Parliament. So if there is a decision to challenge, then in my view, it will be uh, quite simply a political decision. And I think it will be uh, using trans people, already one of the most vulnerable, stigmatised groups in our society, as a political weapon. And I think that will be unconscionable um, and indefensible and really uh, quite disgraceful. There is a bigger issue of principle here, and I'll come on to Keir Starmer's comments in this context. Uh, and that issue of principle is the right of the Scottish Parliament to legislate within its areas of competence. And if we see a challenge this week, then we will be uh, seeing yet more evidence from this UK government uh, of complete contempt for the Scottish Parliament and for devolution in principle. And I would say to anyone um, who might welcome that because they disagree with this particular piece of legislation, if the UK government is able to normalise action to block legislation democratically passed by the Scottish Parliament within our areas of competence on this issue, then that will embolden them to look to do it on other issues and we will be on a very, very slippery slope indeed. So I think it is that serious and I think the import and significance of this would go beyond the particular subject matter of the legislation. Finally, on this issue on Keir Starmer, you know, I start to wonder, and I'm, I suspect I'm not the only one who starts to wonder if there is anything Keir Starmer is willing to stand up and be counted on in the face of Tory attacks. I don't think the UK needs a pay limitation of this Tory government. It needs an alternative to this Tory government. Uh, but on this particular issue, uh, of course, this is legislation that was 
scrutinised and voted for by Keir Starmer's own party in the Scottish Parliament. So he'd be showing, uh, if he backed uh, any move by the government to block this, he'd be showing utter contempt uh, for his own uh, Scottish party as well as the Scottish Parliament. So we'll see what happens this week, but there is no justification whatsoever uh, for the action that is being talked about. Alan Smith from Bower. Thank you, First Minister. Um, looking at the pressure on pharmacies, community pharmacies at the moment, we've been speaking with the Whithorn Pharmacy in Dumfries and Galloway, which is issuing a plea for more GPs to be deployed to the area because it says it's, it's carried out a month's worth of pharmacy first appointments in the space of a week just due to the lack of GPs that there are in the area. They say the pressure is unsustainable right now. I know this is an issue which has been raised with the, the Health Secretary before, so can you provide us with an update as to what discussions have taken place, any actions that are going to be taken in that area, and when that community can expect to see improvements in, in, in the access to GPs? I'll ask the Health Secretary to respond specifically on that issue, and the CMO might want to come in as well on the wider uh, issues. Yeah, happy to. Uh, first message. So I met with Community Pharmacy Scotland last week. Uh, we had a discussion about some of those short shortages. I should say from the first instance, it's really a positive thing that Pharmacy First has been so popular. It has helped us to alleviate some of the pressure that we've seen uh, at, at acute sites. And the message is clearly getting out to the public that Pharmacy First uh, is, is, is a very good and essential uh, service, but clearly only in those areas where we're not seeing shortages of pharmacists. What I've done uh, since last week, as you're right, this question was raised with me, uh, I think in particular by, by uh, Finley Carson uh, in, 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 in Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, I've asked the uh, Chief Pharmaceutical Officer, Alison Strath, to engage directly with those health boards, Dumfries and Galloway being one of them, the borders uh, being another, uh, where we, we see some shortages to see if there's anything further we can do nationally to provide some support for for pharmaceutical uh, support. There's also a number of asks that came from my meeting with Community Pharmacy Scotland uh, last Thursday, to which I've said to them I'll consider with a very uh, open mind, so we'll engage with that uh, quite intensively. Um, I think I'll, I'll hand over to see if uh, CMA wants to say any more, but I think while you're asking about a particular part of the country and particular pressures, I think this illustrates the, the wider importance of when we're talking about pressure on the health service, in this case primary care, thinking in terms of, of the multidisciplinary team and the whole system. So part of you know, easing pressure on GPs is investing in that wider team, pharmacy, community pharmacy, an increasingly important part of how services are de delivered to patients. So there are some longer term issues here for us as well as we continue to uh, holistically support primary care teams to, to help with uh, GPs with the pressures that they face. Uh, yeah, the, the Pharmacy First programme obviously builds on the experience that we've had with the minor ailment service over many years now and, and it's certainly one which I think has been very positive in its development, what it's been able to contribute to the response that we've had over this winter and uh, I know that it's very popular with both the public but also with professionals who work in the system as well. I've been engaging obviously with CPO in relation to how this service further develops over time and how we may gradually expand some of the ability of Pharmacy First to be able to respond with prescribing as well from people who have become independent prescribers. A lot of interest from other parts of the UK in terms of our experience with it in Scotland just now. We're engaging with uh, other health services as well so that we can begin to share the learning that we've had from it with other areas just now. But I see it as a very positive development, one that begins to signal the future of how primary care services will respond to, to the different types of illness and the different um, acuities of illness that we're likely to see over time. Uh, Gina Davidson. Thanks very much, <coughs> First Minister. Um, so Keir Starmer at the weekend was saying that um, the NHS needs real reform or it will die, and he was talking about bureaucracy in particular, rather than finance, rather than staffing. I just wondered um, what your views were on that in terms of Scotland's NHS. And also, just going back to James's question, when he was on LBC this morning, he accused your government and the UK government of using the GRR bill as a, a devolution, a constitutional political football, and that this is not a political matter, but in fact a legal one if there's going to be a challenge. I wondered if well, I, I don't really have anything to add on the GRR uh, point uh, in addition to what I said to James earlier on, except to say, you know, it's only coming a constitutional issue because we've got Westminster politicians refusing to accept the right of the Scottish Parliament to legislate in an area of its own competence and making unwarranted and completely unjustified threats to challenge that legislation. So if anybody's trying to use it politically, it's those Westminster politicians. Uh, the Scottish Parliament, including Keir Starmer's own party, uh, with one or two exceptions, uh, voted for that bill. You know, one of... 
uh, the amendments that m puts on the face of the bill, uh, to put it beyond doubt that it doesn't affect the Equality Act, came from a Labour uh, or originated with a Labour MSP. So those comments to Keir Star uh, from Keir Starmer, uh, he needs to understand that this is not simply a proposal that's been passed by the SNP. This is a proposal, piece of legislation that's been passed by the Scottish Parliament, by a significant majority, MSPs across all parties and the vast majority of MSPs in his own party. And I think he needs to uh, reflect very seriously on that. Um, as to his comments on the NHS, I, I found his comments yesterday pretty dispiriting, uh, to be perfectly uh, frank. Uh, yes, and we talk a lot uh, about this, the reforming of patient pathways and how care is delivered in the NH NHS, that is underway. And, in Scotland and will continue. The see and treat, hear and treat initiatives, hospital at home that I've spoken about, the uh, shift to primary care, multidisciplinary teams in primary care settings, all of that is important. I think some of what he was saying yesterday was you know, quite dangerous in respects and some of the advice he might have been giving to people with potentially very serious conditions not to go to their, their GP or, or to look for ways to bypass their GPs. But I'll uh, not say any more about that because he may have not intended to say exactly what he did. But I think what people in the UK, across the UK, probably want to hear from the leader of the opposition at UK level, somebody who is aspiring to be prime minister over the next couple of years, is a commitment to invest more in the health service would be a commitment to reverse Brexit so that some of the recruitment challenges that are being exacerbated by the loss of freedom of movement can be overcome. You know, we're investing to the maximum that we can in NHS Scotland. We're asking those uh, who earn most to pay a bit more tax using our income tax powers. Uh, so we're doing what we can to maximise the investment going to the NHS, but to go beyond that, we need to see a UK government that actually lifts the level of investment in the NHS. That's a point I was making to the Prime Minister when I saw him uh, last Thursday evening. I don't have very much hope that a Tory uh, government is going to do that, but surely people would expect to hear from uh, the Labour leader aspiring to replace a Tory government actual commitments to significant additional investment in the NHS. And for there to be a complete lack of that, I think most people, not just me, uh, will find that really dispiriting at a time when people uh, hope to hear more and better from a Labour leader. And I say again, you know, Keir Starmer needs to stop trying to be a pay limitation of the Tory government he's seeking uh, to replace and actually start offering some positive alternative. Uh, Neil Poorin from PA. Thanks, First Minister. In terms of your plans to discharge hospital patients into care homes, which you spoke about last week, can you first of all confirm how many um, and how many cases that's taken place uh, within the last week? And also, have there been any reports of increased infections in care homes as a result of this? Uh, this is something that care home relatives in Scotland have been concerned about, as it would mean that the, the care homes shut down to, to them visiting the relatives. Uh, I'll ask the Health Secretary and the Chief Medical Officer to add, but obviously infection is, is monitored in care homes as it is in, in hospitals, and infection control processes and procedures uh, remain important. Um, obviously, the guidance uh, to implement the commitment and the announcement that was made last week was issued and that is work in progress. Uh, we will start to see the figures coming to the Resilience Committee this week to show progress and of course we'll uh, look uh, to see how and in what uh, form we can share that uh, with you. Uh, the additional beds though that we announced the commitment to fund last week is on top of uh, 600 beds that are being used for interim care already in care homes. So again, you know, this is not something that is completely new. This is something that has been used to help with current pressures in recent times and uh, last week's announcement builds on. Yeah, th th thanks so much. Very little to add to that. I just think it's just worth reiterating the point that I made last week that, um, of course, those numbers of delayed discharges are not a static number. People are constantly coming in and out of uh, the, 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 the system and being discharged um, and, and the vast majority, over 95%, being discharged actually uh, on time. So we have really well-established procedures when it comes to discharge into a care home, whether that's an interim place, of which uh, the First Minister is right, there's uh, already 600 beds uh, being used, or of course whether that's on a permanent basis. So we have really good infection prevention control uh, measures uh, in place. Uh, we were up front last week uh, in saying, and I was up front uh, in saying throughout the week, that uh, the high levels of flu we were seeing 
and COVID, for example, may well mean that some care homes uh, will have to restrict their admissions, uh, not, not stop them altogether, but restrict their admissions, and that may uh, well uh, slow progress <coughs> in terms of the numbers we're looking uh, to discharge. But the good news on that, of course, is that uh, flu and COVID vaccination rates in our care homes uh, are exceptionally high amongst residents. Okay. Neil, what we've been doing over the last few weeks in the lead up certainly to the festive period is keeping a very close eye on the number of outbreaks that we're seeing uh, in care homes and you know, they come about for a variety of different reasons. Um, it's not just flu and COVID but, but other infectious pressures such as norovirus as well. So monitoring all those and seeing exactly where that picture is developing and in the run up through December we were beginning to see those outbreaks becoming more apparent, the numbers increasing through the festive period. Uh, at that point they were beginning to um, to, to, to kind of crest and peak. And of course, these are a reflection of the disease burden that there is in the community. There's a direct correlation between how much infection you have within communities and therefore how likely it is that those are then likely to be uh, passed on into care homes. We're now seeing that picture beginning to stabilise as some of the community pressures in terms of infection are beginning to stabilise as well. We continue to keep a close eye on it, obviously, um, but at this moment there appears to be a stabilising picture. Mark McLaughlin from the Times. Morning, First Minister. Has there been any impact um, of the teacher strikes uh, on NHS staffing, securing part-time staff, agency staff, or even full-time staff having to take time off to care for children? Um, I am not aware that that is the case in any meaningful sense, but I'll ask him. No, exactly that, First Minister. We get the absence uh, figures for NHS staff uh, every single week. And looking at last week's uh, figures, it generally followed the, the trend that we saw in terms of viral uh, infections. I'll get this week's figures uh, later. Uh, on this week, but I'm not anticipating, certainly from the feedback and, and the engagement that I've had with health boards up and down the country, it's not a significant uh, factor in a, in, in a meaningful uh, sense. Joseph Anderson from the Scotsman. <coughs> uh, thank you, First Minister. After you announced funding to free up community beds at last week's briefing, the Royal College of Nursing and Scottish Care expressed concerns about the plan, saying they're unlikely to work without addressing vacancies and staffing levels. How can you make a career in the NHS attractive if you won't even pay them what they feel they deserve? Well, we in Scotland, of course, are already uh, offering a pay rise this year that is significantly uh, above what has been offered elsewhere in the UK. Um, that is a pay rise on top of NHS pay that in, on average is already higher than in the rest of the UK and that differential uh, will grow. And we are now uh, negotiating intensively are about to be negotiating intensively about next year's uh, pay rise and you'll have seen uh, some of the uh, latest developments at the end of last week uh, which means and you know I uh, as I said last week I, I, I'm not complacent about this at all but we remain um, the only part of the UK that hasn't seen NHS workers going in strike uh, which I think is an indication of the fact, A, that we do value NHS workers and want to pay them as much as we can within the resources we've got, and that while NHS trade unions uh, are always very robust in arguing uh, the interests of their members, there is an ability to sit down around a table and negotiate with them, and we'll continue uh, to take that forward. Uh, on the point about care home beds, I mean, this is about interim care to help uh, speed up discharge from hospital and reduce delayed discharges. It's not the uh, overall single solution to the pressures that the NHS is facing. Uh, and of course, what we're talking about here are available staffed care home beds. Yeah. Um, and that is important beds that are already uh, staffed, but not currently occupied. Do you want to add anything? The only thing I'd add is that's one of the reasons why we agreed the funding to be able to cover above 25% above the national care home contract, because it was coming back, feedback from Scottish Care, for example, uh, and others who sit in our ministerial advisory group, uh, that, that although, uh, the first minister is absolutely right, we're looking at staffed uh, beds, uh, the way to help with that in the interim, with interim care beds, <coughs> might be that we have to pay above and beyond the national care home contract rate. So that is one of the reasons uh, why the funding that was announced last week allows uh, allows us to, to be able to, to do that, but nothing to add further to, to that. Okay, Mr. thanks. Uh, my list now says Simon Johnson from The Telegraph, but I'm also not seeing Simon, I don't think. Um, nope. In that case, I'll go to Chris Green from The Independent. Thanks, First Minister. Um, just, to, just another figure question. Um, I think last week you gave the figures on the level of delayed discharge as 1,700 patients. I just wondered if there was an update this week on that. And also, um, can we expect any further action to be announced in terms of uh, a ministerial statement or anything this week? Um, 
Firstly, on delay discharge, I mean, obviously, we publish uh, official statistics periodically on uh, delay discharge. So what I'm uh, citing right now is, is management figures. And remember, um, it's a really obvious point, but I think it is one that is, is always worth uh, pointing out. The, the, the delay discharge figure is not a static figure. It reflects uh, admissions and discharges. So the figure is probably broadly, I think, at the moment, uh, similar to what it was uh, last week. Uh, but of course, we continue uh, to try to get it down to uh, speed up the discharge of those who are technically defined as delayed discharges, but the initiative I spoke about uh, in my opening remarks of asking all health boards to review all discharge plans right now to see if we can ensure uh, that even people who are uh, perhaps not meeting the definition of a delayed discharge but might have a, a barrier to their discharge, that work has been done to reduce that as well. Okay. Uh, can you meander from the Financial Times? Thank you, First Minister. Uh, if I may go back to on the gender reform bill, I just want to check, in the, in the event that the UK government does act to block it, what would your options be? What, how will you react? What will you actually do about it? And then secondly, I'm just wondering, uh, is the fact that you're having these press conferences, is it a sign that politically, like you have some evidence that maybe the he negative headlines about the NHS are hurting the, the S&P? Uh, on the last point, no, um, and you can read polling evidence as well as I can, so I, you know, I'm not in receipt of any information that you don't already have. Um, I'm trying to be accessible to the media. Um, if, if we weren't, no doubt we'd be getting questions about why not. So I, I think on these kind of things, it's uh, yeah, damned if you do, damned if you don't. So um, I, as I did during the pandemic, try to be open to your questions and to your scrutiny, and I think it's uh, an important thing to do. Um, on the GRR point, I'm not going to repeat everything I've already said there, but we will vigorously defend the legislation, um, depending on if there is a challenge, and I, I hope there won't be, but the indications would suggest that uh, that may be what we are looking at. It will depend what route to that the UK government takes. If it's uh, Section 33 challenge, then that will go to the Supreme Court, as I understand it, and we will defend the bill in the Supreme Court. If it's a Section 35 challenge, uh, that would require, I think, the Scottish Government to uh, judicially review uh, that decision. But these are uh, technicalities. What I can say in general is that we will absolutely, robustly and rigorously, and with a very, very, very high degree of confidence, uh, defend the legislation. Uh, Kate Foster from the Daily Mail. Minister, um, given the pressures on A&E &E and hospitals just now, um, if there was to be a major incident in Scotland, such as a bus crash or a train crash, um, would A&E departments and hospitals be able to respond to that and give the appropriate care to patients? Um, what are the contingency measures for that? Um, yes, they would. And uh, we have a high degree of confidence in our NHS to respond to major incidents. And that is uh, demonstrated on the sad occasions when we have uh, major incidents. All health boards will have contingency plans in place for a variety of eventualities. Uh, Rachel Watson from The Sun. Thank you, First Minister. Um, I just want to ask about school strikes again. We know following lockdown about the concerns around mental health, education and social um, skills of children, um, the concerns that are around there. Education has now been disrupted again by the strikes. Are you concerned about the impact this is having on children? And yesterday the EIS called for you to show the same urgency to getting a pay resolution with teachers as you have the NHS. Are you going to step in? Um, I, I always get um, slightly, uh, well, I reflect on uh, questions about me stepping in. I, I, I never step out of government. I'm always involved in, in these issues. Um, of course, I'm concerned about industrial action in our schools because I don't want to see that impact on young people um, and I don't want to see teachers having to take industrial action. I think what we have demonstrated it, particularly or most recently, it's not the only example, but most recently in the NHS is that we are not a government that simply digs our heels in in industrial disputes. We are a government that seeks to find resolutions to disputes, a government that tries to treat public sector workers as fairly as we possibly can to maximise pay increases within the resources we've got and to avoid industrial action. And we stand ready, willing, and there are... Uh, you know, have been talks last week and they will continue to do that with teachers as well. Uh, but as we also see in the NHS, it does involve compromise on both sides. And, you know, therefore, I hope we will see that compromise uh, on 
both sides. And remember, uh, unlike the NHS, COSLA is a, a partner in teacher pay negotiations. Um, and I hope we will see that compromise that gets to a resolution. But we are not, uh, and I think this is well evidence, we're not a government that simply digs our heels in and refuses to talk to trade unions. Uh, and lastly, Louise Wilson from Holyrood. Uh, morning, First Minister. Um, I just want to ask quickly on the legislation that the UK government are putting through about strikes and minimum service levels. You've already said that you're against that legislation. I was wondering if you would refuse to cooperate on enforcement of that, much like you did with the trade union bill in 2015-16, if that were to pass. Um, we will certainly uh, not be a willing uh, implementer of any trade union uh, legislation of that nature. I had a discussion with the Prime Minister about this uh, last Thursday when I saw him. Now, it depends, the ability of the Scottish Government to, to do different things will depend on the framing of not just the primary legislation, which is very, very vague in the details that it includes, but the secondary legislation. That, in my view, that bill, uh, given you know, employment law is reserved, unfortunately, and I regrettably accept that that right now is the reality, but the implementation of legislation like this, if you look at the sectors that are supposed to be covered by it, uh, with one or possibly two exceptions, are devolved services. So deciding whether a minimum level of service is required and what that should be would be down to devolved services. So my view is uh, that the legislation, well, the legislation shouldn't happen, take that as read, but if the government is intent on going forward with it, they should not apply it to Scotland. Uh, but if they do apply it to Scotland, they should give the power to Scottish ministers to decide whether or not to, to implement it in the sectors affected. So I made those points strongly to the Prime Minister and we'll see uh, what the response is in coming weeks and months. Any final comments, Gregor? No, no nothing to add. Okay, in that case, thank you all very much for your time.